So the next speaker is Thayer Scudder at Caltech, who for personal reasons couldn't be here today, but is going to be here virtually. And so turn your attention to the, uh, the screen there. Okay, Dr. Scudder, you've been introduced. Um, good. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not there. It's morning here, so I can't say good morning to you, but I'll say good day to you. Uh, I'll be talking about large dams. Uh, I want to talk about uh, two things. One is whether or not they're cost effective, and the other is the absence of sufficient monitoring and long-term studies to know whether or not they are cost effective. Currently, they are over 50,000 large dams operational. Uh, large dams are defined in two ways. On the one hand, those that are over 15 uh, meters in height, and those that are between 5 and 15 meters in height, which have a storage capacity of over uh, 3 million cubic meters of water. The largest dam in the world in terms of capacity uh, is the Kariba Dam uh, on the Zambezi River, which has a storage capacity of about uh, four times that of our Lake Mead behind the Hoover Dam. I'll give you an idea. Uh, of its size, about 150 kilometers long. Uh, I'll be talking to a considerable extent about that because my colleague Elizabeth Colson and three generations of graduate students have been studying the impacts of that dam on 57,000 people who were relocated over a 60-year period. That's a long-term study when I talk about long-term studies. Uh, we started in 1956 and uh, the study continues today because Elizabeth Colson is so interested in it that she retired to Zambia, uh, where she is still operational uh, at 97 years uh, of age. The Academy in 1966 published its first report on water affairs. The Academy Committee on Water Affairs was set up in 1964. Uh, to quote, it is important to state that no major water project in the United States has been studied with sufficient care and precision to determine its full effects on the systems of water, soil, plants, and human activity which it is altered. More analysis is needed of the effects both on the environment and on the economy of actions taken in the development of water resources. Now, if we move ahead to the year 2000, the same was said by the World Commission on Dams, but the World Commission on Dams added, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, few comprehensive post-project evaluations have taken place after the commissioning of large dams. This applies to virtually all regions and countries, with few exceptions there has been little or no monitoring of the physical, social, and environmental effects of dams, which of course is a necessary input uh, to such evaluations. Now, equally disturbing is the relative absence of studies in the <coughs> academic community, uh, both in terms of researchers and in terms of funding of such studies. And what I'm saying is also the case with major other development projects, especially mega projects uh, that characterize current political economies in the developed and developing countries, including, for example, the use of arable land in special economic zones, as in China and in India uh, and Southeast Asia, uh, or the use of um, converting forests to plantations, as in Indonesia, or, core, or the cattle ranches and crops, uh, as in Brazil. So you hear these have these gigantic projects, which in effect are considered to be cost effective, but in fact the necessary research has not been carried out. 
uh, to assess whether or not that is true. Now, this problem is especially true in the social sciences. What are badly needed in the social sciences are studies which are long-term, like the long-term ecological research studies, which were set up by the National Science Foundation in 1977. And then in 1980, NSF founded a long-term economic research network for such studies. And in 1993, an international component was added to that network. Now, Bert Singer, when he discussed this problem of long-term studies with me uh, a few days ago, uh, he had several concerns. Uh, he was concerned, will there be sufficient researchers to carry out this kind of research? Uh, where will the funding come from? And what about a user-friendly system uh, for archiving uh, that information? Well, we're going to have a big problem with the archiving problem. I'm going to have to live for another 20 years to even prepare the data that we have collected on the Kriva and other uh, dam studies. And uh, whether or not I uh, am able to do that, uh, actually my mother lived to 102, so I expect to be lecturing also at that particular time. But uh, as far as Recruiting people to carry out these studies, I don't really see that's a problem. As I said earlier, we've had no problem in recruiting three generations of graduate students. And we've also found it very effective and necessary, obviously for the countries at large, to recruit host country senior researchers to participate. And of course, that's at a much lower uh, financial cost. And also, uh, I've made use in my own work of uh, graduate students in host country students, uh, among host country students. Graduate students uh, for MA degrees and for PhD degrees uh, who then, to a large extent, then actually go to work for uh, their governments in terms of dam construction. So the funding is not going to be too great a problem, I do not think, if uh, we are going to make more use of our host country colleagues uh, in carrying them out. Now, what follows this prologue is a very rapid review. I say it has to be rapid because the paper that I sent to the uh, Academy was 70 pages in single spaced. So I'm going to do my best to cover those 70 pages uh, in the next uh, uh, few minutes. I started off by believing that large dams were a wonderful mechanism for the integrated development of river basins. And what I've learned over a 60-year period is that, yes, there are very important short and medium-term benefits that follow, but they're followed by unexceptional longer-term environmental costs and costs for more than half a billion people who have been disadvantaged in dammed river basins. Now, in choosing my career, uh, a study of large dams was not intended. Uh, as a second year graduate student at Harvard, uh, I went over to Boston University's new uh, school on African studies to take a course on Central Africa. Now, uh, that course was taught by Elizabeth Tolson. And during the course, she told me that she was looking for a colleague in geography and human ecology, human ecology being my field at the time, to accompany her to what was then the British colony of northern Rhodesia to make the baseline benchmark pre-location study uh, of 57,000 people to be relocated in uh, reference to the Kariba Dam period. Now, I had no knowledge whatsoever of community involuntary relocation. Uh, or of large dams. And yet four months later, Elizabeth and I were living in two villages on the edge of the Zambezi River, uh, carrying out what would be a one-year study in 1956-57, and then we were also contracted to carry out uh, another one-year study several years following relocation. Uh, the first couple of weeks for me, uh, I was a mountaineer, and I didn't expect to end up in a rift valley. Uh, 
But uh, this was one of the worst climates in terms of heat and drought uh, in Africa. Uh, but uh, after about a month, uh, I found it just fascinating. And the restudy was fascinating. Uh, I wrote my PhD on the ecology of the Gwembe Tonga. The Gwembe Tonga were the people who were relocated uh, in connection with the dam. The rest of 1960, in 1961, uh, I was in London at the London School of Economics uh, taking a course on uh, African ecology. So I had to find a job for the next year before returning to uh, what was still northern Rhodesia uh, for the Kariba Re study. Now this is where serendipity comes in. Uh, the job I found was an assistant professorship at the American University of Cairo, which included joining a bunch of researchers to study 50,000 Egyptian Nubians prior to their resettlement in connection with the Aswan High Dam. So what a coincidence, within seven years, to be the only person in the world who had had the opportunity to carry out two benchmark studies of large numbers of communities involuntarily relocated because of large mega projects. Now these mega projects <clears throat> take about five years to plan. And that means that you have an opportunity to carry out your benchmark uh, demographic, health, socioeconomic, and cultural studies well before uh, the construction is completed uh, and the area is inundated. And this, of course, is a essential and tremendous advantage because adverse impacts of these projects begin as soon as the government announces that a particular dam will be built. Uh, that is simply because uh, they're not going to build new schools or provide new government services to the area which is soon going to be inundated. Uh, so that what they should do, but often do not do, is they tell the resettlers not to clear new gardens, not to build new houses, not to start new businesses. And so for that reason, by the time they are relocated, uh, they are in fact, their, their income uh, and lifestyle is already worse off. Uh, and that period of difficulty usually lasts for at least two or three years following uh, resettlement. Now, throughout this period, from 1962 to 1973, I remain convinced that mega dams could provide still an exceptional opportunity for implementing integrated river basin development. Now, there are four reasons why I believed this. The first was that between 1962 and the 1970s, uh, that is, uh, remember, there were four years before that which were difficult, but during that period, 1962 into the 1970s, the of standard, living of standard of the Gwembe Tonga people improved tremendously. And that was largely because of the existence of a major reservoir fisheries. And I want to mention this in some detail because these fisheries are important in quite a few large dams throughout Africa and in uh, uh, India. Uh, if they are, and throughout Asia, if they are allowed to be implemented by the resettlers. In the case of the Gwembe Tonga, they responded very rapidly uh, to the opportunity, uh, using gill nets uh, and uh, either drying or selling the fish uh, fresh uh, in local markets. And the income that they made uh, enabled them to significantly increase their material uh, standard of living. Uh, two ways were particularly important. One was they were able to purchase uh, cattle and uh, oxes uh, mainly, uh, plows and ox, uh, ox carts to replace what was a very arduous system of agriculture based on the use of a small, uh, sm short-handled hoe. And so they began to cash crop uh, cash cropping uh, cotton. Uh, soon the Middle Zambezi Valley became the major cotton growing area uh, in what was now the independent country uh, of Zambia. They also used their uh, increasing income to educate uh, their children. 
uh, especially through secondary school. And they were able to get good jobs because with the independence of Zambia in 1964, uh, large numbers of British civil servants left the country uh, and they needed to be replaced uh, and the people who replaced them since Zambia had very few university graduates at the time were secondary school graduates uh, including those who came from uh, the resettled villages. Also during the 1962-1973 uh, uh, period the management of the resettlement was adequately handed over by the project authorities uh, to project a village, to, excuse me, project people's institutions and to uh, various government departments. Now, I've been explaining what major benefits there were, but there were also major physiological, psychological, and sociocultural costs during these years. For example, what data we have suggest increased mortality rates among elders and among children. And that's also true for the Aswan High Dam. Uh, quite a bit of data shows increased mortality rates among both children and elders. Then there were other, other major problems. In most of these dams, governments want to take small communities of resettlers and pull them into large consolidated villages with totally inadequate water supplies. At worst, those water supplies might be polluted wells. At best, uh, they're boreholes uh, with pumps, which of course in time uh, break down and the people don't have uh, the, uh, the money or the ability to maintain them. And of course, then there is considerable population increase uh, in this population of well over 5% per annum, which soon consolidates and makes these consolidated communities even bigger. So we had very large epidemics of uh, uh, dysentery and other waterborne diseases. And in more recent, the uh, cholera has been introduced into these communities, which was never present in the past uh, in these areas. Then uh, on the other side of the uh, reservoir, which was now uh, southern Rhodesia, there was a uh, concealed epidemic of human trypanosomiasis. Uh, which was quite severe. And in the reservoir, of course, uh, schistosomiasis, both uh, schistosoma hematobium and uh, schistosoma mansoni, and of course malaria uh, became more, more serious. Then there was a very strange mystery disease, which killed over 10% of the women and small children in uh, one village. Uh, we really don't know what the cause of that, but the likelihood is poisonous plants, which were they were gathering as relishes, which seemed similar to edible plants that they had been using uh, in the old habitat. Then something I think which will interest those of you who are interested in, uh, in diseases of uh, different sorts, uh, on July is a uh, not uncommon uh, problem in this area. For example, my first research associate uh, died of onuli. Uh, I had to take him to a hospital which took about four hours and during that time he was bleeding uh, profusely uh, fro through his mouth. Now at that time the etiology on onuli was not properly understood at all. In fact it still isn't. But now there are at least two hypotheses uh, which I have followed and are very relevant to a study of the Gwembe Tonga people. One is that the problem is caused by two funguses which are associated with two of the important crops of the Tonga, uh, one being um, uh, finger millet uh, and the other being sorghum. The other explanation, of course, is one which uh, we are very interested in and study, is that it is associated with witchcraft, that witches use poisonous medicines in effect to get at people with whom they are, are jealous or want to get back to. And uh, I was criticized by the headman, actually, of my research assistant, his name was Adam, of uh, village, by not bringing him home. By taking him to the hospital, I caused his death. If I had brought him home, the headman was convinced that they could have cured uh, the problem. Now, by the mid-1970s, 
Well, I had learned that the cost of dam resettlement did exceed the benefits. The best agricultural land, for example, was now under the reservoir, the river banks of the river. So the children of resettlers were unable to find sufficient arable land in the less fertile hinterland areas. Uh, and as incomes began to go, the deforestation of the surrounding areas became very serious. And uh, poorer people began to, uh, to make charcoal, which sped up, of course, the whole process of uh, deforestation. Then, Kriba Dam is approximately 1,000 kilometers above the Zambezi Delta. In the downstream area, very serious erosion of the banks of the river by silt-free waters, destruction of the riverine fringe of forest, reduction of flood recession agriculture and grazing for millions of downstream residents, and serious reduction of the size and wildlife of the Zambezi Delta and of a successful uh, offshore uh, shrimp fishery. There were three other reasons, though, which still influenced me to actually still see large dams as, nonetheless, with more benefits than costs. One was the Tennessee Valley Authority. The TVA was still, at this particular time, a model. For example, in India, it was a model for the Imadar River Authority, uh, which was the a major development authority in India, the first major development authority in that country. The third reason was that I had a number of consultancies, because I was the only person with this kind of experience, literally, uh, international experience, consultancies in Nigeria, uh, the Ivory Coast, and elsewhere in Zambia, uh, which did, in fact, temporarily help thousands of resettler households become less poor than would otherwise have been the case. And for that reason, I do not regret believing for 55 years that dams, in effect, were uh, a flawed but still necessary development option. The fourth reason, of course, was uh, invitations to various international conferences and workshops and articles. And my first pro-dam article was a 1965 one to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which, frankly, I find very embarrassing now. But I think uh, I should read to you uh, a part of what it's about. It dealt primarily with the Kariba resettlers. But in terms of regional development, I wrote, these projects offer an exceptional opportunity for planning and implementing an integrated river and lake basin development program. Aside from par poverty, from sorry, power generation, flood control, and improved transport, such a program should include irrigation and fisheries, market and small industrial centers, conservation zones and national parks, residential areas, and tourist and recreation facilities, granted the need to resettle over 50,000 people, more highly productive environments can be created with new ground rules to maintain and increase resource potential. Well, as I said, a bit, a bit embarrassing that. Now, during the next 22 years, I began to have increased doubts about large dams, but was still hopeful. Those 22 years were the most interesting, actually, of my career, simply because I was dealing now with the three largest projects, uh, dam river basin development projects in Asia. Uh, this was the Mahaweli project in Sri Lanka, the Sardasarva project in India, and the Three Gorges project in China. Uh, the first two I was involved in the planning and implementation of uh, in the Three Gorges project, which I was against from the beginning, uh, in dealing with uh, the planning. I doubt that either of those projects, or any of those three projects, but especially Mahaweli and Sarda Sarva, would now be considered cost effective after their economic, environmental, and social cultural impacts were analyzed. The decision to implement all three of these projects was largely political, rather than based on the careful process of options assessment. Where mega dams, that is even bigger than large dams, are involved, the stage options assessment has often been completely bypassed because the decision to proceed has been made by the head of state. 
Such political decision-making can also jeopardize a project when a change in government <clears throat> or in party politics occurs. For example, in Sri Lanka, when the president decided not to be re-elected, three of his colleagues ran to replace him, including the Minister of Mobility Development. But the former Prime Minister won. He saw the Minister of Mahueli Development as his main uh, opposition. And so, in actual fact, uh, he did everything he could to, <clears throat> in effect, undermine what was the most important project in the country in terms of resisting funding for that project and things of that nature. And to improve his own electability in the future, he used the money for all things, uh, he used it for making low-cost housing in every district to ensure <clears throat> a larger series of people <clears throat> who would re-elect him. Now, Mahaweli was a TVA size project in the middle of a country with five major dams. And during my four visits there, I was very lucky to be working with a senior Sri Lankan colleague, Kapila Wimaladharma, who was a, uh, uh, a sociologist and a government official. And in our third report in 1983, we had to report to the Minister of Mahawili Development uh, when he had, we had become his uh, unofficial advisors. Uh, he invited us to come to his house in Colombo, and we said, Sir, sir your project is not accomplishing its goals, and we do not believe it will accomplish its goals. Uh, he was obviously quite appalled, and at first said he was going to have to resign as a result of that. Now, I'll just go into two of the kinds of reasons <clears throat> which can, in effect, cause the uh, failure of such a project. One was planning. Uh, they didn't carry a benchmark study out of the people who would be relocated because of the building of the dam and relocated because of the laying out of the major irrigation canals. They rather assumed that they would be able to recruit throughout the country people with very small families so that the second generation problem would be postponed, the second generation problem being uh, the second generation finding enough land and enough income to raise uh, the family uh, beyond a subsistence level. Uh, another problem was the head of the Mahaweli Authority of Sri Lanka, a very devout Buddhist whose religious beliefs kept him from allowing the production system of the local people to be diversified beyond the double cropping of rice. And now, the double cropping of rice may be important for national self-sufficiency, but it is a very poor, low-income crop for uh, the project-affected people to have. Uh, at the same time, because of his beliefs, uh, he prohibited the farmers from going into livestock or to fishing, so that their income continued to be, in effect, a uh, subsistence-oriented income and recent studies show that that's still the situation today. Now let's go quickly on to the uh, Sara Saraba project. Uh, this project is incredible. It was going to be India's largest river basin and regional development project. It was going to be on the Namada, which more than the Ganges was India's most holy river before it was to be dammed. Now, it wasn't going to be dammed by just the Sarva Dam. It was going to be dammed by 30 large dams, of which four would be multipurpose, 21 would be for irrigation, and five for hydropower. The dam itself was going to be 138 meters high. It was going to be the key feature for irrigating 1.8 million hectares in four states and providing 1.8 1,450 megawatts of hydropower. The institutional structure was entirely dominated by irrigation engineers. For that reason, virtually no expertise was involved in dealing with over the, re the, over the relocation of over 200,000 people who, to a large extent, uh, were ignored. I personally consider India's record with resettlement to be the worst that I have studied over a 60-year period. 
There are five major reasons for this unacceptable situation, or unacceptable if they occur in any dam. One is the most important, and that's political will. If you have lack of political will to do a good job in terms of the environment, in terms of affected people, not just in the reservoir basin. When I mentioned half a billion people are adversely affected, uh, half of those, those billion, half a billion people are mainly downstream people whose economies are adversely affected, in effect, by the regularization of the flow of the rivers by the dam. So lack of political will is important. Lack of planning capacity, obviously, is important. Lack of implementation capacity is important. Inadequate finance and especially inadequate participation of the resettlement and especially the lack of opportunities for people to improve their household and uh, community livelihood. All five were associated with the Sardas Arba project. Now, during my four visits to the project, I also had an Indian, uh, high-level Indian colleague, uh, Mahapatra, and uh, we reported to the chief engineer. A major problem that we had with the chief engineer was that he insisted that because India was a highly populated, overpopulated country, uh, there just was not sufficient land to resettle uh, 200,000 people, even though that was a requirement agreed to with the World Bank that it just was not sufficient land. Now, Mahapatra and I didn't believe that that to be the case. And I'll have to tell you a little story here. Uh, it shows also that uh, uh, not uh, approving of large mega dams in a country uh, can also be a relatively dangerous uh, pastime. Uh, I've been told on two occasions by World Bank uh, officials uh, in policies that I was uh, uh, consulting on that my life might be in danger. Uh, but we had to find out whether or not the sufficient land was there. There was a non-government organization called Arch Vahini, which had wanted to meet us, but the World Bank had not allowed us to meet, meet us. We were consulting for the bank at that time. But Mahapatra told me that he could arrange for me to meet at midnight a motorcyclist who would take me to the headquarters of Arch Vahini to discuss with them the possibility. Uh, I was going to be in Ahmedabad at the time uh, on a way uh, to returning to, uh, to New Delhi. So at midnight, when I was staying with a friend's house, a motorcyclist of someone I didn't know picked me up, and it took us an hour to go through, uh, there were riots in the city at that time, uh, to get to Archvahini. And I spent five hours there trying to convince them to give me information uh, that we had been told they had. That is that many farmers, post-country farmers, uh, that we mean farmers who would be willing to sell land for resettlement purposes, were willing to sell large land, hung, uh, large amounts of land. Why? Because their children did not want to continue the family farm. They wanted to get educated and join the middle class by getting urban uh, positions. And so these people were willing to sell their land. Those five hours did not enable me to get the information which was necessary uh, because Arch Fahini did not, um, in effect, uh, it, well, they distrusted the World Bank. But they said, well, why don't you come back the next night? And so the next night, the cyclist picked me up uh, and I spent another five hours trying to convince them to get the data, uh, and still with no success. But I told them that I would be going to New Delhi, and the next day I, after being in New Delhi, I would be meeting with the assistant director of India's uh, irrigation department. And if unable to convince uh, the uh, chief engineer that the land was there, and who especially convinced the, uh, the assistant director of the irrigation department, uh, our hands, in effect, would be uh, pretty much uh, tied. Uh, I had given Art Fahini the address of the hotel that I would be staying in. And the morning that, that we were to meet with the uh, assistant director, under the door was a little envelope, and in the envelope were the names of hundreds of host 
farmers who are willing to sell large amounts of land which would be sufficient uh, if a, that was the situation in many, many villages to take care uh, of the resettlers. Now, unfortunately, uh, the Indian uh, government still was not sufficient interested to actually purchase that land and to utilize it for the resettlement uh, of the people. So that today, Sarda Sarva is considered to be uh, one of the worst uh, implemented projects uh, for both environmental reasons and for the local population. And of course, the chief engineer was a, tra a, tra a tragedy. I, I found him to be a especially tragic figure. Uh, and I told him in 1965, 1985, that he was destroying his own project. Well, now we move on to the period of 1998 to 2005, which that broadened my knowledge considerably because, first of all, I was commissioner on the Royal Commission on Dams. Uh, I had expected uh, that I would not be appointed to that simply because my middle of the road position had alienated people who were pro dam and anti-dam, but apparently it was the main reason why they put me on the commission. And it came at a good time, 1998, because uh, I had become a, uh, a research professor at Caltech for the last years of my uh, uh, professorship there um, and retirement in the year 2000. So I was able to spend two years uh, on the uh, World Commission on Dams. And that tremendously increased my knowledge because, of course, we traveled all over the world to visit large dams. I had continued to study other, other large dams. And so after that, well, between 2000 and uh, 2005, I put together what I had learned uh, in my first book on large dams, uh, which in effect was uh, called The Future of Large Dams and published in 2005. And I want to uh, just point out one chapter in that book, which John Gay and I uh, he, uh, wrote about the first statistical analysis that had ever been done by dam of dam resettlement. We found about 46 cases only. That shows you how little data had been gathered on these 50,000 dams uh, for analytical purposes. So on these 46 cases, uh, we, our statistical analysis showed that only three had actually improved project-affected people. Four project-affected people had perhaps restored their living standards. And in the remaining 36 cases, 82%, the impact of the project was to worsen the living standards of the majority. Well, we now come to the present and pretty close to the end of this. Uh, and we come to the 2010 to 2016 period, and I see large dams as a major component of a dysfunctional international development paradigm. And remember, dams are a major component uh, of this globalized international uh, development uh, component. Let's just turn to a few environmental costs here. Uh, Costanza and his colleagues in a 1997 article in Nature assessed that the value of world ecosystem services and natural capital, when you do that, the highest benefits in dollars from 17 categories of ecosystem services are located in 16, biome, 16 biomes. And they came from two habitats, estuaries and freshwater swamps and river floodplains, both of which characterize, of course, free-flowing rivers. I'm aware of no environmental impact studies of large dams that evaluate the financial costs of the reduction of such free-flowing river benefits. Other environmental benefits that are adequately evaluated or inadequately evaluated and protected are forests in dam catchments, in which, of course, open access roads open up often pristine areas especially in Southeast Asia today, where the major tropical rainforests remain, hence the illegal cutting of timber and loss of wildlife. Then there's loss of downstream fisheries as a major reason why large dams have adversely affected half a billion people, 
living within 10 kilometers of free-flowing rivers. That's a conclusion reached by Richter and colleagues in an important 2010 paper. Then there's the failure to evaluate the impacts of climate change. That has yet to become a common feature of impact assessment, in spite of the fact that already uh, destructive floods have had to be released from the Kriba Dam, the Kohorabrasa Dam on the Nigeria, uh, the Kanji Dam on the Niger, and in droughts, in response to droughts, uh, in effect, hydropower has been reduced, for example, in the Volta Dam uh, in, in Ghana. Major deltas, of course, are also negatively affected, uh, especially the extremely adverse impact on Egypt's uh, high dam. And uh, here we don't have the time, but uh, that's been studied in very, very great detail. Uh, by uh, Stanley and Warren, especially in an article in Science in 1999. Uh, the delta of the Nile has, incidentally, about 40% uh, of the agricultural production of Egypt and about 50% of the population of Egypt. Uh, in the 1980s, the Egyptian government realized that the flooding of significant portions of the, uh, uh, of the delta would require the relocation of about at least one million people uh, by, let's say, 2030, uh, moving those people to the opposite end, that is, the southern end of, uh, uh, of the country. Um, in 2007, uh, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, quote, declared the Nile Delta one of three sites on Earth that are most vulnerable to sea level rise. In other words, the Egyptian government is going to have to find non-existent land for millions of people who are going to have to be removed from that area. So, finally, let us end with economic and financial costs. And here I'm going to quote from the recent article by Ansar Flyberg and their colleagues in 2014. Uh, they are all people at the Oxford uh, Syed School of Business. Uh, Title: Should we build more dams, more large dams? The actual cost of hydropower mega dam development, and that article confirmed my growing conviction that large dams are more destructive than beneficial over the longer term, not just to free-flowing rivers, but to people's livelihoods. I had long known that the adverse environmental and socio-cultural costs of large dams far exceeded the benefits to free-flowing rivers and project-affected people, but I always assumed that overall economic benefits were positive for the political economies of nations and for society in general. Now, the statistical analysis, and I quote, of 245 large dams built worldwide between 1934 and 2007 have shown that even before accounting for negative impacts on human society and environment, the actual construction costs of large dams are too high to yield a positive return. The evidence is overwhelming that costs are systematically biased also towards underestimation. So that's the situation as it exists today. Now, uh, I hope we have a little bit of time, uh, and since uh, there is going to be a... Uh, what, a, a, a period of four, 20 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, I want to show you one or two uh, uh, slides uh, as to why dams, large dams, are a poor development option. But before we go into that, uh, I'd like to know if there are any questions first uh, that we can um, bring up. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a rather striking conclusion to your uh, results. Can, can you say a bit more about uh, some of the environmental impacts of large dams, for example, on fish populations that, uh, um, that are unable to, to, to get up to their breeding grounds, et cetera? Definitely. First thing to say is that mechanisms for trying to enable fish to migrate above large dams may have worked for a few species in countries like Canada, but they are not 
at all adequate. In fact, they are completely inadequate uh, for dams in the tropics and subtropics uh, where all of the large dams that I've been studying uh, are involved. Now, in the Mekong, uh, a major problem today uh, is going to be the impact of the uh, already six dams built in uh, the China portion of the Mekong, and now Laos is building two dams on the, uh, uh, on the Mekong. Uh, that will have an adverse effect on the water uh, backing up into the Tonga Sat which is this huge area that the Mekong flows back into uh, in, uh, in Cambodia. Uh, the adverse impact on the fisheries is going to have an adverse impact on literally tens of millions of people uh, in the countries of uh, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and uh, uh, Vietnam, because fish is in those areas, while rice is the main uh, agricultural staple, fish uh, are the main uh, protein. Your, uh, your slides are now up on the screen. Do you want to take us through? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the economic and financial cost things, let's go first to the, uh, uh, the ecological environmental uh, costs. Okay. I have to get up here and look at the Look at it, actually, because my eyesight is not so good. Fortunately, in and again, this is a point I think that uh, uh, that Bert uh, uh, pointed out to Bert Singer pointed out to me. Uh, there are now uh, improved and evaluation and research uh, techniques, which are going to uh, well, for example, to look at free-flowing rivers in three dimensions and things of this nature. So that we can expect, I think, much better information uh, on the nature, uh, uh, on the CO2 content, for example, uh, of uh, uh, free-flowing rivers, uh, on the CO content of, uh, and methane content of reservoirs and that kind of thing. And I think we're going to be able to improve uh, considerably uh, there. Um, no. Then, as far as uh, the floodplain and delta, let me just read you uh, a little section from the Stanley and Warren article, uh, and that will make your eyes pop out. Changes in the natural cycle of Nile flow and sediment discharge had profound consequences, including accelerated erosion along parts of the Delta coastline, marine incursion onto low-lying northern Delta plain sectors, curtailment of flood silt deposition that had formerly served as natural fertilizer and had offset land subsidence, Increased salinization of cultivated land as natural flooding no longer flushed out evaporitic salts. Sharp decline in fish populations, both in lagoons and seaward of the delta, as a result of decreased nutrients carried to the coast, and choking of canals and waterways by water hyacinths, the last effect increasing water loss through evapotranspiration and fostered schistosomiasis. Now, yes, the Nile Delta is a magna serious case, but I can assure you uh, the Mississippi is just as bad. Uh, now, for example, the largest dams in the United States in terms of storage capacity, uh, or actually in terms of surface area, are, are not, uh, for example, uh, Lake Mead. There are several dams on the Missouri River, the largest tributary of the Mississippi. I say, largest in terms of surface area. Imagine the amount of silt that is locked up in those dams and doesn't get down into the Mississippi Delta. Then, of course, uh, the problem of the Delta in uh, China, um, the Delta on the 
Yellow River, of course, that often no longer does the Yellow River reach uh, the uh, South China Sea. As far as the Yangtze is concerned, uh, because of three gorges, already salinization is beginning to creep up uh, the river, and so on. So these kinds of environmental and economic costs, you know, they're, they're, they're absolutely incredible. And now, of course, I mentioned very briefly uh, the impacts of climate change. They're going to be particularly serious on the Zambezi. Uh, southern Africa is going to be very adversely affected by drought. And already, for example, uh, the water level in the uh, Kariba Dam, behind Kariba Dam, is beginning to drop uh, because of climate change. And yet, uh, you don't have just, in effect, problems with uh, drought. Uh, the increase in irregular and very serious floods uh, have been occurring from the Kariba Dam. Uh, and of course, since they try to maintain the highest level as possible for um, hydropower generation, uh, when, it, uh, in effect, extreme uh, rainfall occurs, already they have opened the dam on several occasions uh, with the flooding of villages downstream uh, and causes of uh, quite a few deaths. And then, of course, all of these various things that I mentioned, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sedimentation, the deforestation of the uh, catchments, increasing the sedimentation, of course, and shortening the life uh, of the dams. So what I've been trying to say in throughout this lecture is yes, there are major short-term benefits. The short-term benefits of the high dam to Egypt uh, have been incredible. And the medium-term benefits of the high dam have been incredible. But the long-term benefits are going to be absolutely catastrophic. And I think that's going to be serious for mega dam after mega dam after mega dam around the world. Thank you very much.